Wednesday seminar series. We're very happy to see you here and to everyone online, particularly our distance learning community. We are very glad to have you as always. Um, we have a wonderful talk lined up. Afterwards, there will be time for question and answer, and that includes online. Please put your questions in the chat and we'll read them out. So, oh, and one last point of housekeeping is after this, we are going to go to Marquis to the pub for a few drinks and everyone is welcome to join us there as well. All right. So now I would like to introduce the great scholar and my friend, Emma Tollefson. Thank you, Amy. All right, so um, thank you all for coming, everyone in the room and everyone on Teams. I was uh, roped into doing this last week, so uh, apologies, <laughs> apologies in advance if it's uh, not as polished uh, as it could be, but I thought what I would talk to you about today is the weird and wonderful things that INH people did with their dead. Um, and really what I kind of want to focus on, so this is all part of uh, the research I did for my PhD at Manchester with Melanie Giles. And I really want to try and explore kind of the temporalities of unusual and divergent funeral treatments in INH Britain. And just to let you know that seeing as I am an osteologist uh, and my thesis was working with human remains, there will be pictures of human remains throughout this presentation. So uh, what I will do in the 30-ish minutes today, unless I run terribly over, is I will give you a very brief overview of the funerary record in I know. Britain uh, and when it comes to the Iron Age um, a lot of times people kind of characterize the funerary record as being rather elusive and we have these very kind of traditional ways of thinking about people being excarnated and that's why we don't find as many people uh, and burials from this time period as you might think in terms of population numbers. So what I will focus on today is a cross-regional focus between exploring the inhumation tradition of East Yorkshire, juxtaposing that with the rather idiosyncratic ways people were buried in Wessex, so kind of southern Britain during this time. And uh, my thesis was very heavily kind of science Sciency. So uh, I did a lot of stuff on bacterial bioerosion, and I'm going to question today whether that is actually an accurate microscopic histotaphonomic approach. And then hopefully the majority of the talk will be on messing with bodies and exploring these rather protracted funeral treatments. So to kick off, um, as I said, We've kind of traditionally thought about Iron Age Britain as being a lot of excarnation um, and finding disarticulated human remains spread across settlement sites and kind of the environs around settlements. And that is the case, but I would argue that overall the funerary record in Iron Age Britain is far more diverse than that. So we have the rather iconic square barrow cemeteries in the Yorkshire region that has a very clear link to continental influences. Then in kind of the Norfolk area, we see quite a lot of cremations. Then up in Scotland, we have some brilliant uh, cave burials and uh, very dear to, ooh, very dear to my heart, are the bog bodies of kind of the Iron Age. And then, of course, from Britain, the iconic Lindo Man. Uh, but we also find kiss burials. And then in Wessex, we have people in pits. So when I was doing my master's many, many years ago now, uh, I Working with Melanie Giles, I was interested in kind of looking more into these curious cases of boxed 
and what Dent posited as far back as the 80s to of being curated remains found in the cemeteries of East Yorkshire. So here's a collection of burials from Wetwang Slack, and in particular, 209, 223, and 236 are quite curious because of the formal inhumation kind of burial expressions we have, mainly what we see are flexed burials, um, either on the left or the right hand side, and it's often kind of faced north, south, or east, west. Um, but uh, Melanie Giles uh, argued in her wonderful book from 2012, A Forged Glamour, that there might be some more interesting and rather protracted funeral treatments happening here that doesn't quite fit with our idea of a standard kind of square barrow inhumation. So that was kind of the starting point for my research. Um, but unfortunately, um, a lot of the remains from East Yorkshire are at the British Museum and I didn't get access to do the analyses that I wanted with the majority of the cases that I had uh, kind of targeted. And so I ended up doing a cross-regional study of uh, these peculiar inhumations in Yorkshire, but then also kind of going through the uh, deposits of human remains in pits. And what I was interested in was not looking at the disarticulated remains or necessarily the heads that we find in pits of this time period, but more the complete bodies. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, kind of the majority of my research was scientific and uh, I could have done a talk about uh, studying bacterial bioerosion. However, there are still a lot of disagreements in the field of histotophonomy of whether the degradation we see mi microscopically in bones are the result of the uh, soil conditions in which uh, remains are buried or whether they have something to do with the way that the body is being handled and potentially manipulated before burial. Uh, so I thought seeing as this is still a slightly open question, I would like to just take you through some of the interesting and peculiar case studies from my research and rather explore more conceptually what might have been done with these remains and perhaps most importantly kind of asking the question of why would someone want to intervene and manipulate the body of the dead before deposition. So um, here's a nice selection of the weird and wonderful deposits um, that I was lucky enough to work on. Um, so the three burials here are from East Yorkshire. As you can see, there's the really tightly packed um, remains from Wetwang Slack. No, from, yeah, Wetwang Slack. And then this is uh, an old uh, female from Garten Slack, which also happens to be one of the most lavishly furnished bur burials at this cemetery. And um, as we see from the sketch here, there's definitely some something going on with the body. The way that it's positioned doesn't fit what we would kind of term normative um, burials. But this hasn't really been kind of looked at in depth before. So that's kind of what I tried to do. And then the rest of these images are from Wessex. And again, we see some rather similar positions of obviously like the limbs almost being folded over the body, like the whole individual's been folded in on itself. And then 
just some other kind of peculiar arrangements here. So in kind of exploring why is it that people in Wessex were deposited in pits, there is a, a classic work by Cunliffe looking at pits and ritual deposits and he argues that once the uh, storage pits at sites like Danbury Hillfort uh, was out of use for storing grain, then they were repurposed as uh, ritual deposits of both faunal and um, human remains. So we have here a, a skull uh, with some obvious clear trauma to it. And we also have a really interesting, um, very shallow pit here with three individuals that have all sustained some kind of um, actually quite violent trauma. Uh, and I think what's interesting about this pit is the fact that it's located slightly on the periphery of one of the earliest kind of redevelopment phases at Danebury. So why would you put certain individuals in pits in your settlement. So I quite like what Booth and Madwick put forward when they did a study of Danebury and Southern Farm. Um, and again, they were doing a similar kind of histotaphonomic approach. And what they argued was that bodies were left in pits as a form of protected semi kind of excarnation practice. So that there seems to be something about being able to get easy access to these remains, potentially something about being able to witness the decay of the body seem to perhaps have been important. And what I find interesting at Danbury is that the, some of these pits with more of the uh, kind of complete bodies are found quite localised in one area of the settlement. And so I think it's interesting here to kind of, when asking the question, why these individuals, are we perhaps dealing with some kind of idea around maybe the dangerous death, that your death has somehow been violent, uh, or perhaps tragic in some way, that means that it necessitates a different type of burial um, for these individuals, or are we dealing with what Sharples uh, kind of talks about as being the dangerous dead, that people might have been scared of certain individuals um, coming back to get you basically after they're dead and so is keeping them close by and kind of in a place where you can watch them part of keeping yourself safe um, and then we have brilliant research that has also been done on kind of you know people going back into burials and context and retrieving bones and this might also be one of the reasons why certain individuals are deposited in pits is to have, again, that easy access and maybe retrieving selected relics. But what I was also interested in kind of exploring here was understanding kind of what other technologies did these Iron Age communities have that they could use in the process of manipulating the body because we have to think about obviously decomposition that sets in as soon as an individual dies it's a messy process and perhaps they have been experimenting with some of their food storage technologies so for example at Danebury I wonder if maybe some of the uh, four post structures that have been kind of argued to be, you know, there's loads of granaries around 
are we maybe dealing particularly in this area where there seems to be um, a higher number of people in pits? Are we dealing with maybe a special funerary area? Um, and then kind of circling back to this idea that particularly for the south of Britain, most of the people were excarnated and they were strewn about and therefore we don't see them in the archaeological record. What I found really interesting when going through a lot of the other sites that aren't hill forts, but they are settlements around Danbury, um, there are quite a lot of people that have been deposited in disused quarry areas. Um, and so I think it's interesting to maybe think about, again, this whole idea of repurposing something that's already there for a different purpose. And maybe what they're doing in these quarry areas is repurposing them as makeshift cemeteries. And then traveling back up to Yorkshire, which is one of my favorite um, kind of regions of Iron Age Britain. This is the case study that really grabbed me when I was doing my PhD. So this is Burial 209 at Wet Wang Slack. Uh, and as you can see here, this body has been so tightly contracted and, and packed that it doesn't really take up much more space than the maximum length of the femur of this individual. Now, when I was thinking about this, I was like, well, obviously something has gone on here. Someone has actively intervened. But how can we try and tell that story of what's happened to this individual in the post-mortem interval? And looking at the staining in the grave, I think it's very likely that what we are dealing with here is maybe some kind of secondary rites of wrapping and binding the body over a protracted time period. And then I think it's really interesting that we are dealing with an older lady and thinking about, again, why this individual? So are we perhaps dealing with someone like Melanie Giles thinks about these old women in the uh, Aris culture burials that are often the most kind of rich burials in terms of grave goods? Is there something here in the community about old ladies perhaps being wise women um, and the knowledge that they had through a life that was lived for a long time? Did that somehow necessitate a special treatment once they had passed? And what um, I was able to do as part of my PhD was to include these two interesting burials that were recently excavated, a rescue excavation in Yorkshire at Napton Wold. And here we are dealing with an old woman again and a younger female somewhere in her early to mid 20s. And what was great was that we were able to do some ADNA on this and we were actually able to establish a familial connection. So again, here I started thinking about where is the right place for the dead? And particularly in the Yorkshire region, there definitely seems to be um, a practice of transporting bodies to a particular place where they need to be 
buried. So, for example, from Burnby Lane near Pocklington, uh, there's been some other great ADNA research done, which has established a sister brother relationship of two close by burials. And so when I kind of came to writing up my thesis, I was really interested in kind of exploring these rather unique and, and individual burial histories and kind of then exploring the journey that these individuals make in death. And so kind of to summarise my ideas around this, I kind of looked at it in terms of thinking about the post-mortem interval in kind of the practical dimensions of it. So are we dealing with unique histories where something necessitated kind of the need for allowing for more time for appropriate kind of funerary rites to be arranged, perhaps ensuring that relatives can come so that the right people need to be there to witness the burial. And again, like we see in Yorkshire, this transportation of the body to that appropriate place of burial. And perhaps especially for individuals who died away from home. And then other things, so I quite like in the um, report that was written in the 80s on wet wine slack and garden slack, there's, uh, the excavators wrote in their diaries about how harsh the winter was in that part of Yorkshire and how it would snow over, the passes would snow over. And so thinking more practically about what if you die in the middle of winter and there is nowhere to bury you, what do you do then? And then kind of thinking more along kind of the social motivations. Um, I find it interesting that these people have been kind of interacting with the dead in a way that obviously is rather foreign to us and we have a very kind of divorced and um, keep kind of death at a distance. But obviously death would have been a far more kind of everyday occurrence. Um, so are we dealing with ideas around kind of the halting of time, thinking about these uh, pit burials in Wessex, you know, or is it somehow about kind of defying death? Are we seeing these individuals like um, our woman from Burial 209 at Wet One Slack? Is this somehow about almost defying death and and Basically, I think that people in the Iron Age, the dead lived among the living for far longer than we have either known or appreciated in the past. And so I think a lot of what we're dealing with with some of these kind of unusual burials is that prolonged contact with perhaps ancestors who are more viscerally near to the living. So that was my rather quick tour around my ideas around the weird and wonderful things that I know people did with their dead and these are the wonderful people and institutions that allow me to do my PhD research. Uh, I have a longer list of references for those who are interested and thank you. That was fantastic. Yeah, thank We're you. going to open the room to questions, but I have to start with one because I'm not an osteoarchaeologist. With the tightly packed bones, were yep. these bodies defleshed before they were buried? Well, so the uh, you're thinking particularly maybe on the two or nine. That type of ball. That's all I'm. Just no, saying. well, exactly. Th this was my thinking when I first started it, and why that particular burial really stands out to me. Okay. Because let's go back. This is such a lovely photo. There we go. Yeah. yeah, like, and what's really curious about this burial is, so I should have mentioned earlier that one of the criteria for me kind of targeting these burials to study them was that the bodies had to be in anatomical articulation. So all the bones had to be 
kind of where you would expect them to be, which to me suggests that these bodies have been manipulated when a lot of the flesh has still been on them or maybe quite early in the post-mortem um, kind of interval. And so I think what's interesting here, it, as you can see, like the skull has kind of been twisted um, and kind of pushed back. And I think in the excavation report, it says that, you know, they think she might have been buried in a box, is how they put it, not a coffin, but a box. So she is very tightly packed and would have been, you know, almost too easy to bring um, kind of transport around. But I definitely think that these people have been kind of somewhere in the early post-mortem interval. So um, I don't think we're dealing with perhaps people who have been left as kind of you know an excarnation right and then they've been gathered up and put somewhere else because I think it's far too difficult to then put them back into anatomical articulation so um, with this burial I posited that what they might have done is kind of early on in decomposition they have wrapped the body and as decomposition progresses they have wrapped and rewrapped and tightened it as much as they could until they have effectively got to this stage. Yes. Uh, well, personally, no. Um, I mean, I think what's interesting is a lot of these remains, you know, they are from excavations from 60s, 70s, 80s, and they have been living in archival boxes in museums for decades now. And I really, like I said at the beginning, I really wanted to study more of the Yorkshire cemetery population, but I didn't get access to it because the British Museum thought that my methods were too experimental. And personally, being an osteologist, maybe I am too desensitized in terms of human remains, but I don't like that we have taken these people out of where they were meant to be, and then we keep them in boxes, but we refuse to do any research on them. And obviously we, I think as anyone who works on human remains, we try and be as ethical and as non-invasive as possible. So when I was doing my scientific analysis, I did it on a, one centimetre by one centimetre piece of bone, you know. So I am not destroying these remains. And I believe personally that we can gain far more information from doing that type of sampling than to not do it at all. Perhaps when it comes to kind of histotaphonomic research, it's not been around as long as perhaps, you know, we all do AMS dating of remains now. We we don't really raise an eyebrow about that. So personally, I maybe hope that in a few years we could get to that stage, basically. Brian, did you know? Yeah, just continuing on a bold point. Like thinking about the process of this, how common is how early, first of all, I'm thinking of the sort of decomposition process of around, you know, rigor mortis, so then sort of bloating, and then yeah. blackening, and then that's, was that like the stage where they start finding them up, you think? Or? I mean, personally, I think so, yeah. Um, I mean, what's interesting is the kind of disagreement in the field of histophonomy at the moment is all around the fact that we don't have actualistic experiments. Uh, and I know, uh, a few PhD students at the moment who are working in the US um, on kind of doing more actual studies of how far can we manipulate a body in different stages of decomposition. That's something I would love to study. But yeah, I do think it is quite likely that this was something that was started pretty soon after. Uh, also just, yeah.
Yes. So I have to say that with most of these Iron Age burials, there are no grave goods. So grave goods are kind of the exception. But one of the reasons why I think, for example, they might have used these disused quarry areas as more formal um, places to put their dead is, for example, here, um, you know, we do actually see people being buried with some, you know, jewellery and some brooches or um, I think a couple of knives or something like that. So we do have some material culture there, but not a lot. Um, I think it's likely that they would have worn it, for example, as you can see there, kind of the, the ring is very close to the finger bones. So, um, and uh, from the Grave Goods project that um, Mel worked on a few years ago, there's a lovely article they wrote about these, um, oh, what do they call them? Um, like material cultural objects as being companions in burials and how kind of covering the body might have been far more common than previously thought, basically. We're going to take our next question from one online. Then I'm going to oh, come back to the room because I want to make sure they get a chance. Do you want to read it in? You want to? Okay. <laughs> Jonathan Gladwin asks, other than the wise women, is there a difference in volume of male versus female burials found generally? For example, are there more male burials found than females and were the bodies treated differently? Ah, yes, good question. Um, so I think uh, there are very kind of regional differences in that respect. So for example, in the Square Barrow cemeteries of East Yorkshire, um, there seems to be a relatively even kind of distribution of males and females being buried. But what I found through my case studies of these individuals that, you know, the body look rather peculiar in the grave, they tended to be more female individuals than males, but then kind of um, Wessex is the other way around. So there are more uh, male individuals deposited in these pits, for example, at Danebury, than there are females. The theory why? Uh, I didn't look into that, uh, but I think that particularly for the Danebury cases is um, the idea that uh, male individuals would have been more likely to, you know, die in these violent ways and in conflict, basically. And that, that's kind of what's been put forward there. All right. Um, next question. Miranda Cardoso asks, have you considered the comparisons with the Galatian skeletal ring uh, material at Gordian and Common in Anatolia? Oh, no, I have not. That's really interesting. So, yeah, no, I mean, for this research, I kept it, you know, very, very British. Uh, but, I mean, personally, I'm interested in all of the weird and wonderful things that people do with dead everywhere. And I do know that there are other parts of uh, Europe and the Middle East that have very similar, and Africa, that have very similar ways of kind of displaying bodies. Great segue to the next question. Right. Uh, Debbie Pearson asks, what comments, with wet wang, there are comparisons with the Parisi tribes. Are there any mainly in European comparisons? That's a good question. I don't have any off the top of my head, um, but I I would I'd be surprised if there weren't any. All right, so we'll back back to the room. <laughs> yes, Matthew. Um, so, yeah, uh, yeah, no, I'm trying to think, I mean, I, I'm pretty certain that some of the, uh, the German or kind of, you know, uh, bog buddies from the Netherlands have been, 
presented more as a almost like a formal deposition into the bog that might be um slightly more of a parallel to this so I, I i did briefly kind of obviously talk about bog bodies in uh my thesis because they are a type of curated whether you know is it is it accidental or is it intentional was also kind of part of the discussion that I had in my thesis of kind of trying to see um, whether some of these remains might have been, for example, immersed in a bog for a period of time as a way of kind of preserving the body. Because we do know that, for example, in the Iron Age, you know, there's bog butter, they know of the preservative qualities of the bog and so I was kind of that was part of my exploration of what other technologies and knowledge do they have that they could use when dealing with dead bodies basically. Dangerous like that's why they were whacked over the head, um, or, or for some reason they were whacked over the head, uh, and it's kind of a, a fairly morbid take on this practice. And then when we got to Yorkshire, it, it was a much more uh, treated as much more respectful. The respect there was kind of implicit. Yeah. So um, I mean, I must say that you know, with uh, for example, the Danebury, not not all of the pit burials there do have signs of kind of a violent trauma or interpersonal conflict. Um, but it, it is interesting that at Danebury, we also find, you know, uh, individual heads or bodies without heads also deposited in pits. So I definitely do think there is something different going on here. And as you say, yeah, in Yorkshire, there is far more in a sense, ceremony that maybe we can recognize in our own funerary kind of practices. Yeah, so I, I, I yes, I, I thought along the same lines. So something I didn't include because, uh, like I said, this was last minute. I didn't know how long I was going to waffle for. Uh, but at Danebury, so I mentioned that there is a uh, an area of the hill fort where there's a gully complex and there are several kind of multi-face uh, structures and then a collection of pits with human remains in. And so I put it forward that you know, maybe some of these structures that have typically been uh, interpreted as kind of granaries, maybe they are in fact mortuary houses and they were designated places where people would, you know, I, I envision very much like we have undertakers who, who do this for us now. There might have been a particular part of you know, the community that dealt with that on a more regular basis. Um, so I definitely think that, you know, if you think along those practical lines of what do you do when you have someone pass away in the middle of winter? I mean, the cold conditions are great because they will inhibit decay to a certain extent. But then also, you know, you don't I guess you don't want them just, you know, in the in the corner of your house somewhere. You know, you might actually want a designated place for them. So. Yes. Uh, is a my knowledge there is uh, solely lacking. Um, I mean, I know that there is, uh, particularly in Wessex, there are a lot of faunal remains that have been found. And I think, like some of the human remains, they are in kind of disarticulated states. Um, but 
None off the top of my head. They were like physically flushed before they were then um, deployed. Uh, do we see any of those kinds of um, marks on these bodies? So I, I know that. Uh, recently there has been uh, some great research done on kind of the southwest of Britain by Adele Bricking uh, from Cardiff uh, and she included a lot more disarticulated remains and she did find that there were kind of signs of cut marks um, on those remains uh, however on the ones that I looked at there were none uh, so all, all kind of trauma there was accident or conflict related, not in terms of processing the body in that way. Any others? All right. Well, we are all going to adjourn to Barquis Wellington for the pub. But before we go, could we please give a round of applause and thank you to Emma Tolleston. <laughs>